in these days of, of 2013 as they uh, slip into history. Let's take a look at the year gone by and the week gone by in congressional action with 5th District Republican Jeb Henserling. Morning, sir, and Merry Christmas to you. Morning, Merry Christmas to you. Thanks for having me again. Let's start with the, with the, the, the short rearview mirror and take a look at the budget deal which which not a lot of which almost nobody loved some people found a way to like and you found a way to vote for it tell me how well this is certainly a kiss your sister kind of deal and it just depended on how cute you thought your sister was last thursday all right <laughs> there is a good in this deal there is a bad in the deal and at the end of the day i'm reluctantly decided to support it uh, the bad's fairly obvious there is more discretionary spending to come Uh, in the next two years. That's bad. A small amount of it uh, comes from um, uh, military uh, pensions for future uh, career uh, soldiers. That's also bad. Uh, One-third of the savings of the deal come from user fees, which is kind of suspect. So now I've covered the bad. Let me go to the good. The good is is that there is $85 billion of what we call mandatory savings, and in budget world, there are two types of savings, discretionary and mandatory. Discretionary is something that can be uh, reviewed by Congress every year and um, uh, changed and must be, but mandatory is something that stays on the books forever unless both houses act and the president signs something into law. Long story short, you cannot save America from bankruptcy without reforming entitlement spending. I have worked on this issue for years and years and years, uh, and I know this to be true. So here's the good, Mark. For the first time uh, since I've been a member of Congress, uh, we got Democrats to agree to entitlement spending, and these savings could go on for years and years and years, potentially the gift that keeps on giving. And the precedent is so important. Now, in the big scheme of things, um, these are big numbers to the average American, but when you look at the scope of the challenges we have in our budget, uh, they're quite small, so it's a small deal. And then the last part of the good is uh, $20 billion uh, in deficit reduction, so we are one inch closer to a balanced budget. So, you know, was it three steps forward and two steps backwards, or was it, you know, mm. two steps forward and three steps backward? I don't really know. It was a tough call. And and that's and that's un- what I did. Understandable. And and what I've, I've, I've talked to, clearly, look what I do for a living. I've talked to a lot of people about this, and a lot of them didn't like it, and I totally understand, and I know you do too, the people who said, you know what, there's not enough good in it, and if there's not enough good in it, say no to it. All right, that, that, that's there. there Perfectly that's valid. Point. Absolutely right. But what what do you get for that versus what do you get with this? I um, it, it is unfortunate that the greatest thing about this is it fends off uh, government shutdowns for two years. And the positives that you mention are are real. The negatives you mention are real. But if indeed th- the arena is cleared and we're not engaged in shutdown brinksmanship, that means there's enormous attention to one thing above all else, and that is the complete disaster of Obamacare. Nothing comes along to distract anyone from that. And that's what gets us to a Republican Senate and a Republican president and the ability to make even more progress. Well, Mark, you are so right on that point. And it is sad, but it is true. But ultimately, to advance the conservative cause, uh, we're going to have to win some elections. Um, That is part of what we do. You never compromise your principles uh, to win an election, but politics is part of this. And uh, the shutdown, uh, frankly, got in the way uh, of the story that Obamacare is just cratering uh, in front of us, that tens of millions of Americans are being forced uh, to buy health insurance they don't want at, at, at prices they can't afford on a website that doesn't work. And uh, today, uh, that's where all conservatives uh, ought to be focused, is trying to get our one-sixth of our economy back and our freedoms back uh, to control our health care along with our family physicians. That's where the real fight needs to be. Can you get with Brother Boehner and tell him to stop kicking the Tea Party in the crotch? I mean, dude, I mean, that's just, it's just not, I mean, there are a lot of ways to be a Republican. There are a lot of perspectives. There are a lot of things. We've all got to, we've all got to pull together here, you know? Well, I'm sorry that um, 
this um, this became public, I would say this. Um, there would not be a Republican majority in the House today if it weren't for the Tea Party. And every Republican office holder ought to count their blessings that there is a Tea Party. Uh, occasionally, I understand there is some frustration, and I would question some who say they want to help the conservative cause, but they spend most of their time, resources, and money attacking Republicans as opposed to Democrats. Not that, you know, we all need to be held accountable, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> politically, you ought to be focused on the president and Harry Reid and those kind of folks. So, uh, you know, I think most of us are pulling for the same thing. And, yeah, I thought the speaker's comments uh, were a little bit unfortunate. And, and listen, I, I've, I've asked, you know, my Tea Party brothers and sisters to, to – uh, not so much. I don't want to rein in the passion, but maybe just rein in the language before we suggest that if if you're not Ted Cruz, you're Fidel Castro. You know what I mean? It's uh, all right. Anyway, let, let's move to something that you have that, to put before us that is is something I did not know about. Uh, I did know that we were at about the hundredth anniversary of the Federal Reserve Act. The well, very you're one in a thousand. The creation of the <laughs> Fed. Just because I'm a history dork, but I did not know that there is something called the Federal Reserve Centennial Oversight Project. What's that? Well, the committee I chair in the House of Representatives, the Financial Services Committee, we are taking uh, on the most rigorous reexamination of the Federal Reserve that's ever happened in their history, and they will turn 100 on December 23rd. And, Mark, I would call it uh, a reexamination, not necessarily an indictment, but, you know, um, uh, historians of our economy will tell you um, that uh, the Federal Reserve played a critical role in bringing about the Great Depression. Uh, the Federal Reserve played a critical role in bringing about the uh, stagflation of the 70s. And most will agree that the uh, Fed played a critical role in our most recent financial crisis by inflating a housing bubble. Now, everybody remembers that one. But do me a favor, just give me a paragraph each on what, I mean, cre created in, in 1913. Created uh, the, in the, the Depression coming about, you know, a decade and a half later. Uh, what, uh, what, what, what did the Fed do to, to help uh, nudge the Great Depression? Well, what they did was they let the real money supply drop by a third. I mean, this is what they were paid to do, is to make sure that we had long-term price stability. Uh, they are supposed to uh, gauge the proper amount of money within our economy, uh, and they allowed it to drop by a third. And because of that, uh, it was a key component of the Great Recession. I mean, Milton Friedman, perhaps the most famous economist of our time, says so. Even Ben Bernanke, who I have a number of disagreements with, uh, says so as well. And the long story short is, Mark, we have – and I'm not saying they're bad people – but not unlike the Wizard of Oz, we want to pull back the curtain and show that there is a human being here capable of making mistakes. And right now we have a handful of unelected, unaccountable individuals uh, who can serve all from one party for up to 14 years, who have incredible discretionary power uh, over our economy. And today, as you know, under this program of quantitative easing, uh, they have the potential to bring about an inflationary spiral uh, that will make us look longingly and nostalgically at the Carter era. Or they have the power wow. to send us right back into recession. <laughs> you realize somewhere a former Texas congressman is smiling at this, and his name is Ron Paul. <laughs> well, i got to tell you, I admire Ron Paul on a number of different levels, but he fought for 25 years yeah. to finally get his audit the Fed bill passed through the House, uh, and as chairman of that committee, and I used to serve with him, uh, we remain dedicated to that piece of legislation. And we're going to take a look at, um, you know, whether the Fed has actually stepped away from its monetary policy mission and instead doing fiscal policy, uh, how it's picking winners and losers in the credit allocation formula. And by the way, uh, seniors who are savers are losers. They are losing out tremendously. And so uh, <clears throat> we hope to shine some light here and at the end of this uh, uh, process uh, introduce legislation in the House to reform uh, the Federal Reserve. Right, let's get to what's really important. Uh, Henserling family Christmas plans. What are you doing? Oh, 
well, we're going to go to uh, San Antonio and uh, see the in-laws. And, uh, you know, it is a time of uh, family, and so we're going to be spending time with the family and looking forward to it. So if Melissa's people are down there, I assume you've done the river walk at Christmas time? We have, and I bet you we'll end up doing it again. <laughs> and it's never a bad thing. It, they really, I mean, I, please, we are Dallas-Fort Worth guys up here, and we love from Sundance Square to Dallas to all kinds of things in the various locales. But that river walk, they, not only is it great, but it's really great at Christmas. Christmas time. No, it is a special, magical place at Christmas, no doubt about it. And Claire and Travis are stoked for uh, Christmas, I'm guessing? Uh, as always, they got one more week of school left if we can keep them focused. I'm going to wince. I'm going to wince. How old, how old are they? Uh, my son is uh, 10 in the fourth grade. No. My daughter is 11 in the no, sixth. No, 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 They are three and four, <laughs> Jeb. They are three <laughs> and four, perpetually three and four from when I think I first met you. Indeed. Well, indeed. God bless them all and to you too, sir. Thank you for, for a year of fighting the good fight. And you know we're going to ramp it up 2014, and I look forward to all of our conversations at that time. Mark, very Merry Christmas to you. We'll keep the fight up for capitalism and freedom. God bless you, man. Jeb Henserling out of the fifth.